um, Dr. Justin Bersick earned his master's degree in school psychology and his doctorate with an emphasis in clinical neuropsychology from Ball State University. He then went on to complete his internship and residencies at the Center for Neurological and Neurodevelopmental Health in Gibbsboro, New Jersey, and Trinity Health Hospital in Minot, North Dakota. The experience is focused on neurodevelopmental disorders, acquired brain injuries, and psychiatric illnesses in children, adolescents, and adults. Dr. Bosek is a licensed psychologist, uh, board certified pediatric neuropsychologist, certified brain injury specialist, and national certified school psychologist. He works clinically as a pediatric partner's neurobehavioral health in Fargo, North Dakota. His clinical work emphasizes assessment in the areas of neurodevelopmental, acquired, and psychiatric disorders, assessments in the areas. Um, I'm sorry, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, brain injury, autism spectrum disorders, attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, learning disorders, and mood and behavioral dysregulation disorders. He's also the chief of psychology at MBH, supervising and collaborating with licensed psychologists and mental health therapists. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Bosick is the executive director of the nonprofit organization FASND, which focuses on raising awareness of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. He's also an adjunct professor in the psychology department at North Dakota State University. So thank you and welcome Dr. Bosick. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so this is where I share a screen, right? All right, so disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So it's a new disorder, let me see. A new disorder that was presented in uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder in 2013. Um, 2013, so relatively new disorder. Um, I believe it may have been added as a precursor to uh, childhood bipolar disorder um, due to the high level of carryover that we see in um, uh, between disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and bi uh, bipolar disorder. And considering that childhood bipolar disorder is quite a controversial disorder at this point. Um, we'll go over that as we, uh, as we continue. Um, so my goals today are to uh, discuss the criteria and presentation of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder uh, and bipolar disorder, uh, recognize the differences between the two, and talk about treatment options. Um, uh, those are my goals for today. <laughs> So disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is considered a depressive disorder. These are, depressive dis uh, these are the depressive disorders in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental, Mental Disorders, fifth edition. Uh, I'll refer to it as DMDD from now on, just because it is uh, quite, a, quite a mouthful. Uh, it's considered a, a depressive disorder, um, childhood uh, a depressive disorder. First depressive disorder in the DSM. Um, we've already covered persistent depressive disorder, dysthymia, major depressive disorder in the past um, three, uh, past two presentations. Um, we also discussed how uh, children with these disorders often um, present with a primary presentation of irritability. However, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, um, the hallmark symptom in depress uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is severe recurrent temper outbursts that are manifested verbally and or behaviorally. Um, these could be verbal rages, um, physical aggression toward people or property. Diagnostically, they state that these should be occurring three or more times uh, per week. However, when I'm working clinically, we also have to consider the child's age. So, um, um, outbursts are, are, we have to think about the child's age, we have to think that outbursts are not development, developmentally appropriate for, for the age. Um, so for instance, um, a seven-year-old who's um, irritable and chronically irritable, um, physically aggressive toward Parents, siblings, peers um, having outbursts that are occurring four to five times per week, lasting 30 minutes per week. That would meet criteria. However, if we're talking about a five-year-old who's 
um, you know, uh, getting grumpy about not getting their chocolate milk six days per week and having, having some getting pretty upset for five minutes every day. Certainly not disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, very different. Uh, so it has to be clinically impairing and it has to, um, has to span, um, has to span environments, family, school, peers. Another um, diagnostic hallmark is that mood between temper outbursts is, uh, is persistently irritable or angry. Um, and it's observable by others. Uh, we have to keep in mind that there's an overlap between disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, uh, major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder. Um, considering that, as I've spoken about before, the mood presentation that we see in major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder in children, um, depression is uh, um, often seen as irritability and not always seen as um, kind of a melancholy dysthymic presentation. Um, we also see irritability in uh, bipolar disorder, um, both during manic and hypomanic episodes, as well as depressive episodes. I just wanted to um, kind of make this <clears throat> a little bit more personally relevant, um, considering the times that we're also seeing a lot more of this, and I'm hearing a lot more of disruptive mood dysregulation um, from parents that I'm seeing considering uh, uh, the pandemic that we're going through. Um, kids are stuck at home. Um, we're all stuck at home. Uh, parents are able to see this disruptive mood. They're able to see this irritability that's being presented every day. Um, there's reasons for this. Um, kids need more exercise. CDC says that kids need 60 minutes of uh, moderate to uh, vigorous exercise per day um, and may not be occurring. Some of the kids that uh, I've been seeing recently, their parents have them on a treadmill uh, every morning for 30 minutes, even though they're six, seven, eight years old. Um, they need more exercise. Um, you're getting too much screen time, um, but what can you do when, uh, when kids are stuck at home? Screen time can lead to more um, disruptive mood and irritability as well. I've seen it um, clinically and personally. <clears throat> um, we also have to consider that the brain is a, is a social brain. Um, kids need more access to social opportunities. That's not happening these days with the pandemic and kids are just getting bored. They're getting bored. They're persistently irritable because they're bored and there's nothing to do. It's boring. I hear that five times a day for my own children. <clears throat> um, so also um, diagnostically, um, disruptive mood dysregulation outbursts and chronic irritability must be present for at least one year. Um, symptoms must be present in, present in at least two of the three settings, home, school, and peers. We usually see it at home all the time. We hear that kids are chronically irritable at home or seeing a lot of outbursts at home. Um, but in order to be diag diagnostic criteria for disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, this has to be occurring at um, more than more than just home. It also be, has to be occurring at school and even uh, with peers at times. Um, with peers, I usually see more kind of controlling behavior, um, controlling behavior, and kids getting upset when uh, other kids aren't kind of following their rules, um, but disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and the outbursts that are occurring at school. Um, I see a lot of, or I hear a lot of kids that are flipping tables and um, flipping chairs and that kind of thing. And um, we, see, we see a lot of that occurring in, in DMDD. <clears throat> Finally, we're not meet, uh, meeting diagnostic criteria if uh, children with, um, this condition have a manic or hypomanic episode that's lasted for more than one day. Um, we'd be ruling out DMDD and talking more about uh, childhood bipolar disorder. Um, we'll talk about mania and hypomania here in, um, in, in the next few slides. 
Um, these, uh, I was looking over this before I sent this to Jen. Um, um, disrupt, I, I should have switched these two here, but um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, it, it can coexist with major depressive disorder, uh, ADHD and conduct disorder, and substance use disorder. Um, but TMDD should not be considered as the primary diagnosis if we are, um, if these symptoms could be better uh, explained by autism spectrum disorder. We often see behavioral outbursts, behavioral, um, um, call them rages if you would like, in, in children with autism spectrum disorder. Um, because they have difficulty with social comprehension, they have difficulty with peer relationships, um, and they have difficulty with social communication and social interaction. Um, these behaviors uh, are, not, are not better explained by post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there's a lot of collateral symptoms that come along with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, separation anxiety disorder can also manifest into a lot of disruptive mood types of symptoms, um, especially when children are um, separated from primary caregivers or the person of interest that's causing the separation anxiety disorder um, and persistent depressive disorder. If, we, if, if, it's, if persistent depressive disorder is the, the primary consideration here, a persistent depressive disorder requires um, um, a depression that lasts at least one year. Um, we would have to consider that as being uh, primary because we can see a lot of the irritability and um, outbursts and um, rages uh, that are more um, indicative of a persistent depressive disorder and not, not merely just uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. DMD cannot coexist with oppositional defiant disorder, which I find to be a little bit curious, um, according to the DSM, it cannot coexist with oppositional defiant disorder. So you can't be diagnosing both at the same time. I find that curious because um, when kids are chronically irritable and they're chronically upset and having verbal outrages, um, <clears throat> um, we could, consider that defiance and oppositionality, um, but we don't, wanna, we don't wanna say that that's oppositional defiant disorder when um, it could be better explained by something um, like um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. It also, uh, DMDT can't also uh, exist, coexist with bipolar disorder. I covered that in the previous slide. Um, which requires one day of mania or hypomania, more than one day of mania, hyp mania or hypomania, um, because um, then we would be considering something more like a bipolar disorder instead of um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. DMDD also cannot coexist with intermittent explosive disorder. And um, DMDD can coexist, like I said in the last slide, with substance use disorder, um, but symptoms are not attributable to the effects of a substance. So these, this chronic irritability and these verbal and physical out, uh, outbursts or rages are um, what I gather they're not attributable to the effects of substance use disorder, uh, withdrawal, dependence, the psychological <clears throat> dependence that we're seeing in substance use disorder and it cannot be uh, better explained by another medical condition either. I see DMDD um, in the clinic quite a bit, um, especially now, kind of like I was saying earlier with the pandemic, I think parents are kind of seeing that um, what the teachers are saying about their children's mood, the chronic irritability is um, uh, it's real, it's, um, it's not just due to them not liking math and reading, it's, um, it's, it's something more significant than that. Um, prevalence, prevalence rate is about two to five percent. Um, we see this condition, DMDD, more so in children under the age of 10 years old, and we also see it in, in males. 
um, I feel like the, the, the rates there, um, we see lower rates in, in adolescents and lower rates in, in females. I feel like <clears throat> um, we've covered those in the, in the previous two presentations. Um, and I feel like females were also seeing more persistent depressive disorder, major depressive disorders with chronic irritability. And it's not, um, not so much a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder as it would be a, a persistent depressive disorder or a major depressive disorder. So core differences between a depressive disorder and bipolar disorder, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder being a depressive disorder and bipolar disorder being a bipolar disorder. Um, in bipolar disorder, there is a discrete and significant episode of change in functioning, um, usually secondary to the effects of a manic or hypomanic episode. Um, so we see, uh, see significant worsening of cognition, maybe more distractibility, um, just difficulties thinking, getting work done, getting schoolwork done. Uh, we see more... Um, um, worsening of um, behavior. Um, also, behavior may just be more erratically different. There may be more um, increased goal-directed activity, as an example. Um, children, I, I've seen children needing to clean and needing to um, uh, complete projects. Um, and uh, just increased goal-directed activity in general. We're also seeing a lot of physical symptoms in bipolar disorder <clears throat> in children. So sleeplessness, kids um, only getting you know three, four, five hours of sleep per night when they should be getting maybe say 10 to 13 according to the CDC and yet still being able to fully function. So um, those are some of the core differences between DMDD and bipolar disorder. Um, Others, um, children with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder have chronic irritability. It's persistent, um, it's present over many months, um, at least a year. Bipolar disorders are episodic conditions. Um, in between these episodic conditions, you may see um, episodes of relatively um, uh, normal functioning, if you want to call it that. Um, whereas disruptive mood dysregulation disorder is not. We're not seeing distinct periods of significant functional decline in DMDD, whereas we are in bipolar disorder. So those are some of the, the core differences there. <clears throat> so um, with DMDD being a depressive disorder, uh, childhood bipolar disorder is a distinct category in the DSM. Um, that is uh, under the category of bipolar and related disorders. There's bipolar one disorder, which requires a manic episode, not necessarily a depressive episode. Bipolar dis uh, bipolar two disorder, which which requires a hypomanic episode. The hypomanic being less severe than manic, uh, as well as a current or past major depressive episode, not necessarily disorder. Uh, major depressive episode in which they, they meet some of the criteria for major depressive disorder or persistent depressive disorder, um, but they don't meet all of the criteria. So it's a less severe form. And then there's uh, cyclothymic disorder as well, which we see much more often in children, which requires one year of um, numerous hypomanic symptoms and numerous periods of depressive symptoms. So we're seeing a lot more um, ebb and flow um, and a lot more um, manic, hypomanic signs and symptoms as well as depressive symptoms that are occurring much more frequently within a shorter time span. So let's talk about mania. Uh, mania, um, adolescents, children with uh, mania typically display psychotic uh, symptoms, delusions, hallucinations. Um, they have vastly unstable moods. 
Um, there may, like I said before, maybe a significant deterioration in behavior and performance, say at home, school, with peers. Uh, classic symptoms for children with mania include pressured speech, uh, racing thoughts, flight of ideas, things that may be more recognizable um, for uh, caregivers, teachers, peers, uh, restlessness, agitation, uh, sleeplessness, pressured speech, flight of ideas, racing thoughts. Um, you may see sexual disinhibition, um, evidence of uh, expansive grandiose beliefs, surges of energy, and um, Children with mania, hypomania may also present with volatile erratic, uh, erratic changes in mood, um, excessive mental excitation, irritability, belligerence, and um, um, like I said before, volatile and erratic changes in mood, <clears throat> which are episodic, like I said before. Other bipolar and related disorders, you can, you can kind of read there. Um, those are just the ones that are listed in the DSM. Childhood bipolar disorder is a very controversial topic. I think that maybe that, that's my, um, that's my Clinical intuition is as to why uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder was introduced in the DSM-5. Um, it's a controversial topic. Um, agreement on the clinical presentation of childhood bipolar disorder is not uh, clear. I have quite a few references that I've cited here. I'm not, uh, I think I, as a neuropsychologist, I, I want to get into them a little bit here. Um, the clinical presentation of bipolar disorder um, in childhood and adolescence continues to be debated. Um, researchers and clinicians continue to rely on adult criteria um, to superimpose onto children to, uh, to make a diagnosis of childhood bipolar disorder. Um, neuropsychologically, we can't find um, any differences cognitively executive functioning. Um, we, can't, we can't find anything that's significantly different between children with uh, bipolar disorder and um, um, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, and then um, childhood, bi childhood bipolar disorder and um, things like ADHD are both going to um, display symptoms of Irritability, impairment in social relations, increased substance use, underachievement, um, and um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the symptoms are very difficult to parcel out between many of the different childhood disorders, and we will talk about how we parcel some of those things out and make a proper diagnosis. <clears throat> but it's very difficult. Um, so in order to make a diagnosis of childhood bipolar disorder, we have to think of, uh, we have to look at the course of the illness. Um, chronic irritability, it's not bipolar disorder. Uh, chronic attention problems are not bipolar disorder. Symptoms have to be cyclical to be bi a bipolar disorder. They have to be episodic. Um, and most people believe that uh, it must include, especially with mania. Um, the hallmark symptom of mania, which is um, um, uh, expansive mood. In order to make a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, there's also a strong genetic leak, uh, link, so we have to take a thorough family history. That's very important. Um, but I also found that mood charting over time is very important. We'll talk about that in my last slide. <clears throat> we have to look at mood charting over time in order to be able to um, look at some of these um, these moods, these mood mood patterns. See if they're if it's cyclical or if it's chronic. Um, we have to be able to. Um, if we do mood charting for long enough, we have to be able to predict when the next um, cycle may be coming up 
and then take proper precautions and uh, treatment um, treatment precautions. <clears throat> Bipolar disorder is much more um, severe than uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder may include, uh, often include suicidal, homicidal ideation, plan intent, um, which should include hospitalization, if that's the case. Maybe not hospitalization, but at least a needs assessment. Um, a lot of times when I see children and the primary uh, concern is uh, bipolar disorder, there's also medication that's, um, that's, that's in place, or at least being considered. We also see um, co-occurring disruptive and destructive behavior. And then um, another one of the things that we see oftentimes is chronic severe anxiety disorders that come along with bipolar disorder, as well as a history of um, suicidal ideation and uh, attempts being more common, especially in the older ages, adolescents. <clears throat> Lifetime estimates of childhood bipolar disorder range from a uh, uh, half a percent to 2.5%. Um, it's extremely rare in young children. Um, rates increase after puberty. Um, milder bipolar, uh, bipolar 2 disorder and cyclothymic disorder um, are much more common than bipolar 1 disorder. Um, and although many consider um, bipolar disorder in children to be controversial, um, research shows that about 60% of those with bipolar disorder have a first episode prior to age 19. Um, so they meet symptoms, sign symptoms of mania and hypomania previous to age of uh, 19. <clears throat> um, there's also a lot of comorbid symptoms that go along with uh, childhood bipolar disorder. Some of the most common and typical, um, some of these may come as a uh, surprise, separation anxiety disorder being one of them. Um, young children with separation anxiety disorder, there's a, there's a high incidence of um, that turning into more of a disruptive mood dysregulation disorder as they become older. Um, another one is generalized anxiety disorder, um, where there's excess mental um, overstimulation, excitation, in generalized anxiety disorder, which um, in generalized anxiety disorder, we're looking for something to worry about. So worrying is coming out of the blue. We're worrying about worrying, even though we may not have something to worry about. Well, that mental excitation may actually be a sign of a <clears throat> hypomanic um, episode as well. So we have to um, consider that as a potential uh, co-occurring diagnosis um, or something that's going along with uh, with uh, bipolar disorder. There's also a high rate of co-occurring ADHD, oppositional and conduct disorders, as well as substance use disorders. And like I said in the last slide that we can't take lightly at all, suicidal, homicidal ideation plan uh, and intent. So let's talk about treatment options for um, bipolar disorder as well as, as disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. There's no cure for either of these disorders, just like there is no cure for um, um, severe mental illness. Um, but there are things um, that we can do to help people with um, children with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, uh, bipolar disorder, and any other type of um, severe mental illness. Uh, multimodal approaches are necessary in cases of disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and bipolar disorder. Um, so we have to consider therapy first. Um, this includes individual and family therapy, um, but oftentimes medication is appropriate as well, um, especially if uh, behavior is, is clinically impairing to the degree that we're seeing suicidal, homicidal ideation, or we're seeing destructive uh, behavior, we're seeing disruptive behavior that um, is not allowing families to leave their homes, even though we're in um, that situation right now. Um, they're not, not able to leave their homes, they're not able to go to restaurants, they're not able to have family members over, 
um, because these mood symptoms that the children have are so uh, impairing to the family. <clears throat> so then we have to consider medication as a um, treatment option as well. Um, we have to consider behavior-based therapy. Uh, oftentimes this is included in psychotherapy, individual family therapy, behavior-based therapy. There's also other options. Um, occupational therapy can work on behavior. Um, but there's multiple, um, um, there's even behavior-based therapies that, that can go into schools and help, help with schools, which is just a beautiful thing that I've, I've seen recently, especially in this area. And then like I, I, I was speaking about earlier, monitoring symptoms closely and mood charting is extremely important, um, just so that we can notice some of these signs and symptoms of DMDD and bipolar disorder. And um, if we're able to do that, we're able to see if something is more chronic and more indicative of DMDD or if it's more um, cyclical like bipolar disorder. And if we're able to do that, then we're able to start looking at the antecedents, things that are leading up to these um, episodes of mania or hypomania um, and the consequences of these, <clears throat> these conditions. And then modify those and then predict when they're coming up and then take the appropriate um, appropriate measures. Oh, um, a shout out here to uh, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, uh, Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, DBSA, I, I use their mood charting uh, quite a bit. Um, um, they have some great mood charting on, on their website that I've given to families quite quite frequently that help us um, work on um, cyclical kinds of uh, mood conditions and monitoring many things, many things like um, sleep, um, nutritional intake, um, you name it. They have some great, some great things that we can look into and, and um, um, correlate with, with mood and, and then fluctuations in mood so that we can get it right. So that is all, those are all of my slides. Um, not sure what happens here after I click this next one. We go blank, end of show. I should have put something funny in there. <clears throat> next time I will. Okay. Thank you for that, Dr. Bosick. Yes. Um, just a couple of questions that came through. In the mood disorder dysregulation, um, when there is a child who is not sleeping and they're going down to that four and five hour time period and then they still have a lot of activity and are not feeling or seemingly tired, um, and that's not the bipolar piece, do they eventually just kind of crash? Do they... Do, do they eventually come into that crabby tiredness where they're going to end up in a downswing at some point or how long does that time frame go for? If that's the case, and they're not chugging Mountain Dew all day long, <clears throat> um, then we're going to see the, the, we're going to think that's more of a bipolar type of condition. We won't see crashes. Um, we're going to see more normal functioning. Okay. Um, even without, even without um, being able to sleep as long as we should be. Um, because you just don't see that in, in disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Usually kids with uh, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, um, there may be some sleep disturbances, but certainly not to the degree that, um, that you see in bipolar disorder. Um, okay, thank you for that. How can you differentiate between this and the intermittent explosive disorder? Um, what is the DSM criteria for intermittent explosive disorder? Um, intermittent explosive disorder, um, uh, I would say the chronic irritability piece is, is the big one between disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and intermittent explosive disorder. I, I don't see intermittent explosive disorder being diagnosed very frequently anymore. Um, Sometimes I see it being uh, co -di uh, comorbidly diagnosed, um, but the biggest one would be um, the chronic irritability because 
intermittent explosive disorder, usually, um, usually kids are still not chronically irritable, maybe some irritability, but then there's also these intermittent explosive disorders that may come out of nowhere. Um, they're not more, um, not more well explained by the chronic irritability and severe irritability that we're seeing in DMDD. And then when there are people who have mood charting and they're able to identify going down in their mood into a depressive state, does behavioral activation work when they are feeling tired, not wanting to engage in activities that they previously saw as enjoyable? Does behavioral activation work as far as encouraging them to go out and do those things anyway? Great question. And that's going to be something that um, is going to have to be be monitored closely and um, hopefully at that point when we're doing enough um, mood charting that's um, that's noticing those symptoms so mood charting has obviously been done for quite a while so hopefully we're working with a the therapist at that point and if we're working with a therapist at that point they're going to be able to help children um, um, start slowly and do the things they, they need to be doing um, to um, get back into a state of behavioral activation that is um, appropriate for them in their current state. Can mood charting be done with primary care? With the primary care physician? Right, um, correct. You, I'm sorry? So if they're being seen continuously over a period of time with the primary care, or if a family is, is cognizant enough to do that with their, with their kiddo and supply that information, is it something that can be worked on with the primary care if therapy is not available? I hope. I absolutely hope. Um, because if we're not able to work with a therapist on a, a regularly consistent basis, then um, we, we'll leave it up to the families. And oftentimes we leave it up to the families to be able to do these things and mood charting is is much more simple than um than it may than it may sound i, I tell parents mood charting can take three to five minutes per, per day you know how much did you sleep um did, uh, you know how many meals did you eat today did you get your protein in did you um um was there an episode rated right one to ten um how was mood one to ten um could take three to five minutes per day so um, usually we leave it up to families and um, uh, if we can bring that data into a primary care physician, if we're seeing a primary care, say every three months, then um, absolutely uh, and, and, and certainly hopefully. <clears throat> Is the resource you recommended earlier, was it the Depression and Anxiety Mood Alliance? Uh, Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, so dbsa.org I believe. Is that a resource that parents could use to assist with kind of that journaling? Yep. Okay. Yep. They have, they have handouts on there. Handouts on there. And I, I really appreciate that website. I will post that to the, sorry, the Project Echo website. I'll post that, a link to that resource. I apologize. My dog was outside whining, so. That sounds like me when I'm doing telehealth at home. I have a cat, that's my shadow. <laughs> Um, yep, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong there with the dbsa.org, uh, maybe tbsa.org, Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance. Um, they do great work and they, they keep up to date and it's, it's, they do a great, a great job.